My name is Richard Morales and I'm the Manager of Community Partnerships at the LGBT Community Center. I'm really happy to partner with the Bureau on this, so I just want to send it off to the Bureau and New York Queer Zine Fair too and all the participants. I'm really looking forward to this. Hey, thank you, Richard. Um, hello, I was about to say welcome to the Bureau, but we're not at the Bureau, we're all home. Um, <laughs> My name is Greg Newton, co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division with mm -hmm. my partner, Donnie Joko. He speaks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're happy to welcome you to Shh, I'm Listening, um, which is presented by the Center and the Bureau and New York Queer Zine Fair. Um, and New York Queer Zine Fair, for those who don't know, uh, was something that Paul Moreno and Charlie Welch started in 2015 when they did an exhibition uh, at the Bureau. And they did the Queer Zine Fair in conjunction with that, and they've kept it going. So we're happy to be here tonight with everyone. Um, so tonight we're going to hear from four queer zine makers, uh, Kel Karpinski, Elvis B., Louis Martin, and Paul Moreno. And first up, we have Kel Karpinski of queer sailor zines, which you've probably seen at the Bureau. Um, Kel is a queer zinester and librarian researching and making zines about queer sailors, Times Square, and film. Kel also co-organizes the New York Queer Zine Fair. Please welcome Kel Karpinski. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Greg. I appreciate the intro. Um, so I just want to say a few things about New York Queer Zine Fair before I get started. Um, so, as Greg mentioned, um, Charlie and Paul founded it in 2015. Um, after um, Charlie moved away last year, I um, joined Paul to co-organize the 2019 New York Queer Zine Fair. Um, it was the first year we held it at Brooklyn Public Library, and we had a record turnout. Um, it, was, it was really fabulous um, <laughs> for all of those who were able to make it. Um, so, as, as of right now, uh, 2020 New York Cuisine Fair is still happening as far as we know. <laughs> um, you know, obviously a lot of things are up in the air, um, but we, we have a date set um, October 17th. We'll see, you know, what happens when we get there. Um, we will be at Brooklyn Public Library again this year. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out to Lee Hurwitz from Brooklyn Public Library, who has um, helped us tremendously with this and is also just doing a ton of great queer programming um, at BPL as well. Um, so we're hoping to have um, a programming form for you all soon. Um, in the past, we've sort of uh, flown by the seat of our pants and, and found programming here and there, but we want to open it up a little more and have folks um, contribute and see what folks are interested in doing and um, go from there. So hopefully we will have that all to you out soon. Um, and then you can expect um, applications for tables probably uh, closer to early summer. Um, and you can find us on um, Twitter and Instagram at nyqzf, is that? <laughs> nyqzf. <laughs> yeah. com maybe? Or well, that's our website, that. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, that's where we're at with the zine fair. So, um, yeah, so I guess I'm going to read now. <laughs> um, so yeah, if, if, for those of you who are familiar with your work, with my work, sorry, my work, I, yeah, I'm a little nervous. Can you tell? Um, I mostly do stuff about queer sailors and I feel like that's what most folks know of my work. Um, I wanna read tonight from two of my zines that I think are um, a little um, underappreciated, let's say. Um, and, but I also wanted to say that um, I know we're not supposed to be talking about the thing, um, <laughs> but I made a little mini zine, um, uh, queer sailor zine for uh, quarantine um, that is called The Rhyme of the Thirsty Mariner. Um, it is digital, um, it's free for everyone to download, um, and uh, you all can find it at uh, tiny.cc slash q5 underscore five, and I'm just going to throw that in the chat for you all. Um, and then if folks want to take a look at it later, um, that is a little, uh, a little treat for you all. Um, 
Okay, so um, the first scene that I'm going to read from um, is called um, To All the Boys I've Loved Before. I don't know how well you can all see it. There's some good parentheses action going on. Um, so it can also be read um, to all the boys I love as well. Um, so uh, this is not an exhaustive list. And also full disclosure, um, these are not all technically boys. It's boys with an I. <laughs> um, we barely knew each other, and the kind of fling we had is the kind that can only happen during those first weeks of college when everything is new and strange. I feel like I was a completely different person then, and you were some kind of rebound from my high school relationship. It wasn't good, and the sex was bad too, but there were some good moments, like when we camped out under the stars. I saw you just weeks after, or just weeks before we graduated, nearly four years later, and it felt like we had never known each other at all. I wouldn't dare inflate your ego by writing something about you. You, among others, who also did not make this list, are the reason I avoid dating people I know have strong Leo placements. Um, when things ended, I thought you would be a, a person I would never get over. Now I can't even remember if we ever said I love you. You were the first boy I ever slept with, and you thought that gave you much more power than it actually did. It was easy to try new things with you because as much as I wanted your attention, I didn't really care what you thought. I invested too much time in you for how little you had to give. My biggest regret is that I let you borrow a chat book by an Uruguayan poet that you never returned and I'll never be able to find again. Her mother once called you in a squinkle. She was not wrong. Um, this whole zine came about because I was thinking about books I couldn't get rid of because of the memories attached to them. I'll never read that book again, but it reminds me of hearing the author speak at that conference and seeing the shooting star behind you as we talked outside. I didn't expect it to be that cold at night, and so I pressed myself against you. I didn't expect it to be quite that cold in her attic. Nothing else happened those nights, even though we had our shared history, even though I wished it would. That was just after I had, ha I had spent the night with him for the first time, and I thought about how I had started my morning in his bed and then ended up sharing one with you. The first night you kissed me, I slept with someone else. I know I shouldn't have for a million reasons, but I was sick of waiting, and I knew that I could. I never told you that, though I'm not sure it would have changed anything. I have so many snowy January Massachusetts memories with you. You're one of the only boys to ever bring me flowers. You worship my body in a way that made me blush. For months after you came over and we watched documentaries from the library pressed against each other in my tiny twin bed. When I moved away, I left a copy of the book of haikus in your mailbox, the one you read to me when I was too anxious to sleep that night in DC. There was an electricity between us, but you were so awkward fumbling. I let you kiss me the day I came to break up with you and didn't. We could never strike a balance after that. Any kindness you interpreted as an invitation into my bed and any boundaries you thought were malice. I built you up in my mind too much. Winding around the streets of Northampton under blossoming trees, you spoke of coming to spend the summer with me living between the lake and cornfields. That night I went home with you and we slept together in your bed and never even kissed. You were the first actually queer boy I dated and that felt like a revelation. That summer, I went to Ohio and you on a journey to Nova Scotia. I had always thought you were cute, but maybe a little too cocky. Turns out I like my boys cocky. You would come over late night after work and bring me dessert from the restaurant. The more time I spent with you, the more time I realized that you were actually pretty great and maybe it wasn't just about the sex. Hardly a month later, you left for New Orleans. You barely said goodbye. And then I took the train to you. The first time you made me come, you said, I love you. <laughs> uh, I dated you and your boyfriend for a while when really I was only interested in you. It got messy, but not because of us. The first night I accidentally ripped out one of your nipple piercings <laughs> and years later, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> years later in a small Illinois town, I would accompany you to the piercers to get the other one removed. You're still a close and valued friend, but I can't help but love telling this part of the story. 
It felt like we were middle schoolers. You told him you liked me. I told her. You came to visit me at the bookstore where I worked. In an uncharacteristically bold move, I wrote my number on the back of a bookmark. We walked in the cold through the farmland toward the river, only to be stopped by a cop. I was so giggly and nervous in the best way possible that night, but you thought it was hesitance. Now when I see him giggle in the same way, I find it endearing, familiar. You wrote me a Dear Jane letter, but then New Year's came and we slipped along the frozen streets of our town back to my room. You would read me Whitman and recite poems in Spanish from memory. And the last one, um, so this is actually someone I'm currently still seeing. And um, when I told him that he was in this, he uh, had a little had a little fit. So we'll see if um, if he hears this, if he how he feels after this. Um, you said you never noticed me until I cut off all my hair. Our first date was on the night before Thanksgiving. We drove around in your car forever trying to decide on a restaurant. The way you interlaced your fingers and mine felt electric and had me reeling for days. There's something so perfect and beautiful and still about the city the night before holidays. We were the only ones in the restaurant, or if there were others, I didn't even notice. Weeks later, when I hadn't seen you, I imagined I saw you on the train or in the library or other less logical places. And then that morning, as I walked up the steps, I swore I saw you standing there in your uniform looking handsome as ever. I thought you were a figment of my imagination, and I touched your arm just to make sure you were real. In the weeks that followed until you left, you found every excuse to touch me. Give me your hand, feel the fabric of my shirt, all these tiny ways that were acceptable at work, but still no one knew. I like that we shared the secret. To me, it was so obvious. No one else can make me blush like you do. Um, okay, so that's that one. <laughs> <laughs> After I've just shared lots of personal embarrassing things about myself. Um, okay, so my second one is a little bit uh, more low stakes. Um, <laughs> but again, I think is another one that, um, not as many folks know. Um, so I'm actually gonna share my screen with you all. Um, hang on here. Okay. Um, so can everybody see this? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Okay. Um, so this is, um, Queer Sailor Zines presents uh, The One Where Sunny Never Dies, a Sunny Corleone Godfather fanzine. <laughs> um, hang on here. I have a hard time watching The Godfather past the point where Sonny dies. I often watch until this scene and shut it off. Sometimes I pause it, take a break, and come back to it, but more and more I can't watch the rest. His death roughly falls at the midpoint of the film, which is surprisingly true for both the regular version and the Godfather epic version, which is the one that's in chronological order and features some extra scenes, mostly of hunky Bobby G in Italy. I would like to propose a version of The Godfather where Sonny never dies, um, but instead is just cruising the Long Island Expressway for all eternity. Please stop the film at approximately one hour, 52 minutes, 56 seconds, if you would like this experience. Uh, when I put the DVD in to rewatch The Godfather while working on the scene, it automatically started playing at this exact moment. Santino, Sonny, Corleone is the best member of the family, and here's why. He's a hunk. This is peak James Conn here. Sonny is clearly the dreamiest of the familia, minus young Vito, no respect, disrespect to Bobby D. He looks great in a suit. Yes, this is very similar to he's a hunk, but it's a very important distinction to make. He's very passionate. You might call this being hot headed, but I'm gonna say he's passionate. Look at all those emotions. The internet seems to think he's a fire sun and water moon. I tend to agree. His family is the most important to him. This is kind of a no-brainer, but still. He found Tom on the streets and befriended him. Poor Tom Hagen was abandoned and Sonny is the one who brought him in. He has no tolerance for domestic violence. You fuck with his sister, he fucks with you. I like to think this is just a general rule with him when it comes to domestic violence. He's not afraid to speak his mind. This goes hand in hand with being passionate. I want a man who can express himself. Yes, please. The man is well hung. His wife brags about it to all her friends. Also, is it just me? Or maybe does it seem like they're poly? Am I projecting a little? Okay, maybe. 
He gets all the ladies. Clearly he's doing something right because they cannot get enough of him. Please see the previous points made. He always seems to know where the snacks are. This one I think is easily overlooked, but to me is a very important quality in a person. One should always be in close proximity to Italian wedding cookies. Please see the New York Times article, The Wedding, I'm here for the cookies. Did I mention he's a hunk? I'd like to live in a world where Sonny never dies, one where he's not gunned down in his prime, or maybe he survives. All right, all, thank you. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Cal. All right, next up we have Elvis B. Elvis B is the creator of the long running Homos and Herstory comic zine. Uh, which includes flashes of queer history over the century. They are also the co-founder of the NYC Feminist Zine Fair, FEST, an excited potential for queer feminist creativity in these unusual times. Please welcome Elvis B. Hey. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, happy to be here. Happy to be here with this falcon, great, you know, a live animal. <laughs> who's falcon bombing this meeting. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna go right ahead and share the screen. So let's try to do that. Technical moments here as we attempt to jump into the future together. Um, do -do -do. All right, looks good, almost there. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, cool, so my name's Elvis. Um, yeah, so I do a zine called Homos in Herstory and Oh no, I'm frozen. Ah. Okay, yeah. So here's some of the covers over time, um, briefly. <laughs> um, so usually it's like different decades. Um, and basically just trying to, you know, kind of get back in the groove that queer people have always been a part of history, um, that they're not new. They've always been here. It's pretty awesome. And um, throughout all this uh, COVID madness, I've been really shocked to find that the rainbow is being stolen by children as a COVID symbol. No, <laughs> unacceptable. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not into that, man. Um, <laughs> so we want to take the rainbow back. Um, so this is just like a fun milk carton. I didn't draw it. It's a milk carton from the 50s. Um, and it's tomboy milk love it so it can't get better than that so i think queer presence has just always been part of the everyday um and so yeah in my comics i try to just kind of give a little glimpse um so this we're gonna jump through history real fast but this is one about sexologists have people ever heard of those some have they're like these spooky all-knowing medical men who are like we know everything about sex and science and lesbian orgies wait no <laughs> so on the right we have um it's a real quote from 1906 from the director of the zurich insane asylum was just you know observing a normal day in a local mental institution he was running he's like there's all these lesbian orgies all the time seasoned with alcohol um so i just like that that's a real quote from history and uh you know, that nymphomaniacal lesbians were just prancing through the streets at this time. It's pretty much my takeaway. Um, so yeah, another very scientific uh, viewpoint that was shared was that these, um, I don't know if folks can see the quote on the left, um, but it was some of the female inverts can whistle admirably. So that's a quote from another very serious scientific man, Havelock Ellis, who's kind of one of the big names. Um, so he believes that yeah, the way you could tell a gay person was their excellent expert whistling. <laughs> now, I know for myself, this is 100% true, but <laughs> for others, it may not be the case. So um, just a comedy. Um, and then on the right is um, a little snippet from a contemporary historian, not from the past. Um, but Lillian Faderman has speculated that based on, you know, actual history and cases, there were thousands, literally thousands of people um, who were assigned female at birth that were living as men. And it's pretty cool. I mean, they're out there. We don't know how they identify it exactly, but the fact that that's like not even an ambiguity, it's just history is pretty awesome and pretty interesting. Um, so we're fast forwarding into the 50s. Um, Oh no, wait, okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, these are some lesbian pulp novels on the right. Um, 
you know, very calm, you know, prim looking women sort of vaguely touching each other, but not quite, just almost. Um, they could, but maybe, maybe something more, it's unclear. Um, so if anyone's ever seen the movie Carol, this is kind of like the magical Carol world of like, you know, subtlety and uh, unspoken things, very romantic. Um, so I have a whole zine about like the 50s and all that strangeness, but I like to think that queer people are like the most secret spies because they have all these codes, you know, and everything's very above the, <laughs> below the surface. So we're experts during the Cold War. Um, so I zoomed ahead here. <laughs> this is my favorite one, um, <laughs> and probably true. Um, <laughs> take away. So if you weren't sure, this is a religious truth that I'm promoting here. And um, yeah, so that's an actual lesbian pulp novel cover. So um, yeah, things got a lot more trashy as the decades went on, um, and you know, a lot more accurate. Um, <laughs> so. We're kind of floating away. This is kind of a medley of a lot of different zines, but um, then we're just briefly gonna kind of dive into the bookstores and you know, uh, the Bureau of Your Bookstore. So you're into like, you know, gay people in books. Yeah, so um, yeah, in terms of feminist bookstores, oh wait, there, uh, this is a slide from 2016, but some of these have actually gone away. So if you're watching, you can kind of do a little checklist and think, which ones have I been to? Hopefully some. Um, I think, yeah, Wild Iris has already closed, which is sad. So keep your feminist bookstores open at all times, especially now. <laughs> um, we need them. So yeah, there were in the mid 90s, about 120. Um, so you just be like, yeah, traveling through some random city, like, oh, I'm in Austin, Texas. Let me go to the like multiple feminist bookstores that are in this area, weird. <laughs> uh, we don't have that. So it was a big friendly organization called Amazon that stole sadly <laughs> some of the thunder of um, a lot of those bookstores. And actually what I learned in my zine was that the feminist bookstores hung on really tight. So they were kind of like some of the last ones to go. Um, so California in 1978, Flashback to your memories of the 70s. You were cruising through River Queen books. I mean, these titles are really <laughs> kind of out there. Um, I don't really understand I See I a Woman's Place. I think it's supposed to mean I See a Woman. That one's in the middle. I don't know. People are really um, literal back in the 70s. So, <laughs> um, but anyway. <laughs> so now there were 13 recently, and there's, I think, fewer still. And they were cute and helpful like that little bookstore in the middle. Um, and yeah, so leaving the bookstores, um, <laughs> basically the theme is community. Um, and so yeah, I run the NYC Feminist Zine Fest, um, which I started in 2012 with my friend Kate, who is really great. And um, yeah, we've, we're still going. We had to sadly postpone. So there, that was like a tragic loss that COVID smooshed our zines. And at that time, I didn't even believe in COVID. I was like, this is all nonsense <laughs> and they had to kind of um, pull me in to reality so we'll be back but pause on that um and yeah the magic um so when i think of zines i think of a lot of gay people in a really small space being really sweaty together and it's really great <laughs> um so yeah we're gonna kind of switch gears again to my last little segment um so these are just a few slides from like an unfinished comic about me and my grandma, um, who is not gay, but you know, hey, I'm gay, so whatever, this is in the umbrella. Um, but yeah, so my grandma Sylvia, she lived to be 102. And so kind of, I have us here on like a little captain's boat together. Um, I was really involved with her life as a caregiver and as a person, and she was always the captain of the boat. So I think, um, you know, that's the cool thing about aging. You get to be part of someone else's story. Um, so yeah, we spent a lot of time in some weird institutions and they were a little creepy to the point where <laughs> I was actually scared of these individuals who work there. Um, real life photo of this woman, um, <laughs> terrifying. So yeah, I don't know why these people were so freaking angry, but they were. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of like sort of carceral undertones, I think, to um, a lot of institutions, but especially, you know, um, nursing home type facilities have that for real. Um, and yeah, it's a little creepy, but um, 
what's more creepy and scary to me is ageism. Don't be bad. Don't be ageist. Why? <laughs> Why have we got to play ourselves like that? Um, it's just strange because we're all going to get older. So I just find it really um, funny. So that's kind of what this comic is about. But just, you know, it's very silly to be ageist because we also will get old. So it's an ism that we are all affected by. You know, um, I know that's obvious, but it's just something to think about. Um, and yeah, the culture is really ageist in a lot of ways. Um, so this is just a little snippet and I'm not making fun of this friend, but a lot of friends that I had at that time were very naive and they'd be like, oh, that's just so great. I want to be a hundred. It's my life goal. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's great. I'm so glad. Like, that's really cute. And it is sweet. But like, what do you think that's going to look like? Like, where's the reality? You know, like you think in your head, you're going to be freaking Angela Lansbury solving crimes every day. <laughs> I'm like so impressed if that's you, that's super great. But like, you know, there's a lot of complexity in what that reality is like. So um, if you are out there, Angela Lansbury, I do not, you know, <laughs> no words, but, um, but yeah, it's just a complex experience. Um, and yeah, we have all been attacking the medical industrial complex for centuries, um, collectively um, through multiple different health crises, um, but it still kind of is the same. Um, so it's all still kind of like this. And I made these slides before COVID, but I've always been really skeptical of doctors. So now that we're in this health time where doctors are the heroes all the time, and I actually just heard the clapping outside, I just kind of have to take a step back and question <laughs> how much trust we want to put into this exact system that we have now. Not that doctors are not our heroes. I know that would be wrong to say, but... <laughs> just that it's complicated and doctors versus nurses there's just so many hierarchies um that are a little weird so um i'm gonna kind of mosey a little bit quickly through these because they're in the wheelhouse of care but um this is relatable now we are all on our phones um i noticed a lot with my grandma that all the new technology just had no relevance to her. She would go to robocall and be like, who is this weird woman who is calling me? <laughs> this woman is like really unfriendly and like, why, what's her beef, you know? <laughs> like, she just says the same words. And I'd be like, oh, it's a robot. And she was like, why would a robot call me on the phone? So like, we just kind of went back and forth <laughs> with that. And we didn't really get to solve that mystery. Um, <laughs> But I think there's a lot that's lost. And when you talk to older New Yorkers, they will be like, oh, the subway used to be a really friendly place. People used to talk to each other all the time on the subway. Just the, the whole city had a, like a friendlier vibe and there were no ro robots, which um, is good. So here's some New York parents just to like bring you back into caregiving and everyone now is sitting at their house, but usually we're trying to run for our from our own children. <laughs> <laughs> let's be real, uh, New Yorkers are classic. We just want to get as far as possible from the people we created. Um, and yeah, this is just to wrap it all up really quickly. Um, a woman I heard on the street talking to her nine-year-old son and she was like, yeah, you know, you've got to figure out, I know you're nine, but like, what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to get like a PhD? Like, I... It seems like maybe you want to work for foster kids, but I'm not sure from what you're saying to me right now. And he was like, nah. he looks really confused. So I just think we have a lot of mixed messages and we have a fast culture, but I like things real slow. So let's just slow it all down and chill. And yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> so. Thank you, Elvis. We're slowing it down all right right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Our third zine reader is Lewis Martin, aka the art engineer. And you may know Lewis from the recent YouTube video he posted uh, where he interviewed Paul uh, about his recent exhibition that almost opened at the bureau. It was so close. Almost. We shut down the day before. <laughs> But at least um, there's that little video of Lewis and Paul talking, which you can check out. It's on our Facebook page and uh, I think uh, Instagram and all that stuff. Um, so Lewis Martin is an artist, uh, 
He has a podcast and he is a new age capitalist, which you'll have to explain. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Thank you. Well, hello everyone. I am an artist. I'm a podcaster and yeah, I'm a new age capitalist, which basically means that I really am a huge proponent of creative people having equity in everything we do. So it's something that I feel has to be said, especially in a moment like this. So that's what it is. But, uh, but thanks for creating this space in this moment to be able to share what artists are doing in their homes. Um, my zine in particular is kind of a response to my baby sister having a baby. And I have no children of my own. So in some way, my sister is my child, which makes her baby my grandchild. So I kind of felt moved and inspired to want to create something that I could leave some hidden messages or not so hidden. So I wrote a fairy tale, an existential fairy tale. And I'll share that with you right now. So this is only my second Zoom uh, meeting, so bear with. Okay. Voila. So it's called Ava Darling and the Bubble. And it's an existential fairy tale about the wonders of being. I'm a collage artist, so a lot of the material you're gonna see in the zine is from a yoga book I found when I was traveling in Seattle that was just beautiful and I kind of like ate it up and now it's in everything I do. And also I take a lot of other source materials from fashion magazines and things I find here and there. Uh, so it's mostly a visual odyssey. So I'll take a few seconds before and after as I read it. So Ava Darling and the Bubble. Mm. It meant nothing in staring and peeping or thinking about her. The air had grown heavy from a season of faithless winds and the sun was nowhere to be found. The bird just needed to be still. In the moonlight, the trees and the leaves, the water and its ripples came together the same way hands and fingers come together in play to create puppets of shadow and light. Leaves and water became her. It was the bird's creation with the willful light of the moon. From something unseen, a new form came into focus. But Ava Darling was conspiring, making waves of ponds and jungles of moss to be born. Dispersed and full of potential, Ava Darling was just ingredients compelled to hear again, to remember what made her active and alive. No longer a shadow, she climbed the darkness and asked the moon for a door. Doors on the moon became windows and windows became mirrors of water and leaves to turn into flesh. One is always two, Ava darling, you are one of flesh and time and another of light and thought. On mounds of land and desert winds, she's born, still all potential and dispersed ingredients to simply become, just show up, is what came to her in a choir of voices. This new world welcomes this new body, and all is still. In her, the two selves expand and stretch. What to become, her choir proposed, to leave this space and become a person full of love and to dance with foreign shadows and that of her own? I am a bubble, fragile and finite, but I'm also free and light, is what she heard. What to become. Ava Darling picked and plucked what was left of the tree of life. Lovers, friends, secret languages, and passages to hidden corners of earth. 
What was hers waited patiently, always anticipating the bird, the moon, and time to take its course. And time came and went for 10 minutes or perhaps 10 hundred years. Ava Darling dances with monsters and makes a circus of life, a spectacle of joy and wonder with vices here and there, all in her right. Focused and centered, she felt a calling to be still, to remember the flight of the bird and the phases of the moon. She stretched the limbs and petals her body bore. The tingles and aches, a mix of ecstasy and horror reminded Ava Darling that skin like time was just a bubble of soap in the air or in a glass of champagne. She was the creator and the artist to decide now. Far from the gaze of old monsters and the and pull of former vices, she poses and prayed, danced and chanted. In stillness, she multiplied and sang with the choirs of her thoughts to become Ishtar, the daughter of Kotlkyu, page and empress of every tribe. In the world, not of the world, she heard and Ava Darling became one of both flesh and light. Like in the first sunrise, the last sunset greeted her with an embrace of stillness. And like the fairy tales of past, a kiss granted her eyes to see colors of darkness until darkness was no more. But like no fairy tale before, it was her shadow's kiss, all her own, that granted her the eye. The choir sang like harps and drums, a farewell to her bubble. Bodies became doors and doors became windows of flesh and bones one more time. And that was all that was uh, there was to that. Ava Darling breathed and exhaled the last light of that bubble. Then a burst. The bird and the moon in a world reversed welcome their child to be born again and again and again and again. The end is the beginning. And that's it. Hey, thank you, Lauren. Beautiful images, really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it was really, really fun to make. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making it. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Sweet. And next up, we have Mr. Paul Moreno. Paul Moreno, a queer artist, zine maker, designer, and uh, what is this? Oh, the co-organizer of the New York Queer Zine Fair. <laughs> Paul is looking forward to the opening of his exhibition problem areas at the Bureau of General Services Queer <laughs> And who knows when that'll happen? But it who will knows? happen because the art is installed. So please welcome Paul Moreno. Thank you. Um, thank you guys, uh, all the other readers for being here tonight. Um, I, I weirdly don't have any visuals to share. So you're just gonna have to listen to me and um, I don't know, imagine, I guess. Uh, while I've been in quarantine, I have been uh, working on a piece of writing uh, that actually started out as a zine and then I had all the images pulled together and I thought it needed a little text, like a paragraph of text. And now I have like a 10 page essay, which I'm going to read little bits of. Um, I'm actually gonna read the first part of it it's, an, it's in three parts, and I'm gonna read the first part, and then I'm gonna read parts of the third part. Um, the uh, overall title is Late at Night and Wide Awake. And um, the first part is an essay in verse. 
which I will read right now. Late at night and wide awake. Like nicotine, the desire to see this is in my blood. Science and family lore suggest I come by my dark skin, eyes, and hair from being a descendant of Jalisco, a variation of the Nahuatl name Salisco, meaning over a sandy surface or place of the sandy eye, which was part of the Aztec empire formed in the early 1300s in what is now Western Mexico. The Aztecs worshiped Zayatukutli, god of fire, god of heat in the night, and god of volcanoes. In his honor, once a year, they removed the heart of a man and replaced it with a small hearth filled with fire, the flame of which would be used to relight the domestic fires throughout the city. Fire and smoke is always an inherent part of worship. A millennium before Salisco was founded and in Eastern present-day Mexico, the Mayas were the first to smoke. They smoked tobacco and other herbs in religious ceremonies and also maybe sometimes just for fun. The dream-inducing clouds they blew spread throughout and beyond pre-Columbian America to the Teotihuacano, the Toltec, to my aforementioned ancestors, the Aztecs. The Mayan smoke traveled to indigenous people farther north in the Americas, then on to conquistadors, the colonists, and the world. Mayan pottery is our earliest known source of depictions of smoking. For example, there is a ninth century painted vessel on which we see a monkey smoking a slender cigar which emits a snake of smoke the monkey's head is cushioned by a dream cloud out of which crawls a man. The monkey's phallus is fully erect and pokes out from under his belly. He holds a puckering piece of fruit. Is this monkey a deity or priest, some Mesoamerican hallucination, or just a gooned out monkey masturbator? Note my use of the word cigar. For centuries, in the place we call the Americas, smoking meant igniting loose tobacco or herbs in a pipe, or lighting a roll of dry, tightly bound leaves, putting the unlit end in your mouth and puffing away at the burning embers. Then the Spanish arrived in the 1500s and wanted in on the action, but had no idea what they were doing. They likely misunderstood that a Mayan word, sicar, which meant smoking, was the word for the thing which was being smoked. Thus, the Spanish coughed up their name for this smokable bundle, cigarro. The French modified it to cigar, which led to the English word cigar. It is also possible that the word cigar derives from the Spanish los cigarales, the name of the place where the Spanish, after ravaging the new world and bringing newly discovered plant species and vices home, established the first European tobacco plantations. Los cigarales on the outskirts of Toledo suffered plagues of cicadas, cigarras in Spanish. Those cigarras, however, were probably actually langostas. Langostas are locusts. Langostas are also lobsters. Europeans in America were often wrong and confused. No wonder they needed a smoke break. Incidentally, the actual Maya word for cigar is chamal, which sounds a lot like camel, which is a popular brand of smokes. But the brand name camel is not a white misappropriation of a brown word, but an odd racial allusion to the Ottoman Turks, who perfected growing a very mild form of tobacco in North Africa. They also play a crucial part in my love of smokers. For centuries in Europe, men could not keep their mouths off this exotic new world smokable treat. But it was the Turks during the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856, who took smoking to the next level. Turkish soldiers would wrap their newer, milder strains of tobacco in old newspaper, then lit up inhaled the smoke into their mouths and swallowed the smoke into their hairy chests, achieving a sensation that was at once relaxing and energizing. This caught the attention of British and French soldiers who were there being as helpful as ever. 
the British soldiers took this inhalation back to England, where it warmed the air that was damp and close. The British had had tobacco since the colonization of North America, but they had never dared swallow. The French, also having learned to inhale from the Turks, coined the diminutive word cigarette. The French government, always concerned about the needs of its people, began commercial production of cigarettes by the mid 1800s. These French cigarettes became a favorite of the creative class and led to the height of images of men smoking in art. Smoking wasn't just for monkeys anymore. So that was the first part. Um, <laughs> it's so weird that I can see people reacting, but I can't hear it. Uh, the second part is, um, I'm not going to read, which is um, sort of a look at depictions of men smoking in art. And it needs a lot of visuals and um, it's long, so I'm skipping it. And the third part goes into other depictions of men smoking um, and sort of, it's a little bit more, of a memoir and it's, I'm going to read the beginning of that and then I'm going to skip to the ending um, for the sake of time. And uh, just a note before I start, in the second part, I talk a lot about the French painter, Frédéric Bazile. And in the part I'm about to read, I sort of allude to that. So here we go. Um, part three, L'ambulance improvisée. Going back to Basile for a moment, I was fortunate to see the major retrospective of his work, both in Paris, 2016, and in DC, 2017. One of the paintings that most struck me was his 1865 painting, L'Ambulance Improvisée. This is a portrait of his close friend, Claude Monet, who was laid up in bed with an injured leg. I imagine Basile providing daily care to Monet as his leg healed and as a result, having plenty of time to pour his passion into this loving portrait. Basil was likely in love with Monet and this love surely remained unrequited. This love surfaces, however, in a sumptuous picture of wallpaper and blankets, sleeping gown and bed drapery, in which Monet is deeply reclined, tethered to a contraption Basile fabricated to help elevate Monet's bare injured leg. Monet looks seductively at the viewer, at Basile himself, or at me. The hand of my eye cannot help but caress every surface. Monet's right hand is held awkwardly at his sternum, almost in the Byzantine tradition of the sign of the cross. I see a ghost of a cigarette in Monet's right hand, Monet may have been smoking off and on during the making of this picture, but I think the cigarette was painted out as Basile's hopes of romance were extinguished. Breakfast at Tiffany's. When I see the painting L'Ambulance Improvisée, I am reminded of a scene in the film Breakfast at Tiffany's, Blake Edwards, 1961. Audrey Hepburn enters through the window of George Papard's opulently decorated apartment, startling him awake. George is naked in bed, having just finished paying the rent before Audrey's break-in. Audrey assures him that his previous guest has in fact left. I watch him roll over to get a cigarette from the nightstand and Audrey takes one herself from the desk. As they chat and get to know each other's secrets, George casually smokes in bed. His outstretched arm holds his cigarette toward me. I notice a bit of his underarm hair. They are both professional seducers and he wastes no time allowing the neighbor who came through the window into his bed. He takes her cigarette but keeps his own as she curls under his arm and he looks at her with a care that is surprising for a relative stranger. This is one of many times even as a kid, I wished I was Audrey Hepburn. Uh, Rope. Perhaps one of the first and weirdest movies I ever saw about a same-sex couple was Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, 1948. In this very coded movie, Brandon and Philip are a dandy couple who share a lovely New York City apartment and who sublimate sex with murder. 
Murder is the secret act they share, and it has just occurred as the movie begins. From outside the apartment, I hear a scream, and then I am in the living room with Brandon and Philip and their suddenly flaccid guest. Brandon turns on the light, and Philip asks him to turn it off. Brandon obliges and lights a cigarette. Too bad we couldn't do it with the curtains open and in the bright sunlight, Brandon remarks. I see Brandon smoke again when the first guests arrive for a party being thrown that evening. When Rupert, played by Jimmy Stewart, arrives, he is already smoking. Rupert lights another cigarette as he approaches the buffet. Dinner is served from a chest where the body is hidden. As everyone eats, I watch Brandon nervously listen with an unlit cigarette in his mouth while his mentor, Rupert, explains the ethical, though theoretical justifications for murder. Brandon finally lights up again as he promotes himself as an actual living example of someone who should be allowed to commit murder. He delivers this in a subtle Jimmy Stewart impersonation. Eventually, I see everyone is smoking, and this is mirrored in the billows of chimney smoke I see through the wall of windows behind the guests. I notice elegant cigarette cases constantly emerging from well-tailored suits. And when we approach the denouement of the murder, Rupert uses his cigarette case as a device with which to interject himself into and delicately reveal and dismantle the two murderers' plans. I watch Brandon Light even more nervously now, a cigarette for Rupert, as he begins to undress them. Then there's a section about the Merchant Ivory film Morris, which I'm skipping, a section about North by Northwest and my own part of Idaho, which I am skipping. There's a long section about parting glances, which I am skipping. And, um, I am going down to a section about the movie Cousins, and then I'll read to the end. Cousins. A smoke occurs in the first scene of the first gay porn I ever watched, William Higgins' Cousins, 1983, though I saw it in 1989. Two college-aged guys in white briefs dangling their feet into a swimming pool and sharing a smoke, more likely weed than tobacco, talk about girls and school. The blonde cousin will soon start the dark-haired cousin down a path of man-on-man -man sex in which fire and smoke are a frequent backdrop. Their own peccadillo ends in a bashful kiss. Perhaps all a cigarette is is a bashful kiss. I started smoking when I was 14. I smoked on and off into my 30s. I stopped for years and then started again in my 40s. I then gave it up for Lent one year, and now I don't consider myself so much a smoker as a smokist. I don't regularly carry cigarettes. I don't smoke every day. I can easily go weeks without. But there is something about a man smoking that penetrates my soul as if summoning an ancient instinct. Freud might call it sublimation, but I do not think that smoke or even the cigarette is a substitute for cock. More, it is a totally arbitrary symbol for an affection or closeness. The easy and effortless way a man holds a cigarette is how I long to be held, strong and gentle. The pauses in a day when you stand outside to smoke, relax a moment, indulge in a momentary pleasure, open to a chat or a flirtation are the most exciting of moments to me. Perhaps it is also a touch of taboo. Do we ever lose the fear of being caught doing something by our moms, smoking or otherwise, and does that not make it all the better? Perhaps the sublimation is really this, these words. I am certain they are not strictly about my love of smoking or the cigarette as a sort of Madeline that triggers memories of trauma and delight. By describing my fascination with men smoking, I simultaneously relive the pleasure of every man I have smoked with, and I fan the flame of every smoky fantasy I ever had. When the cigarette hits my lips, it connects me to a community of men who sometimes must persevere through a challenge and who sometimes just want to delight in an indulgence. 
Acts of the Apostles. In Acts 2 of the New Testament, Peter and the other apostles are gathered in a room in Jerusalem. After having witnessed the ascension, they experience the blowing of a violent wind and tongues of fire above their heads. They suddenly all speak in different languages. These are signs of the presence of God, if not the presence itself. Peter then addresses a crowd that has gathered outside. He quotes a 9th century BCE poet prophet, Joel, who spoke these words from God. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. Joel and now Peter both explain that God is able to send horrible wrath to Jerusalem, but that wrath is avoidable through repentance. The worst sin the people of Jerusalem are committing is that of othering, the hatred of enemies. God wants us to love each other. Like nicotine, the desire to see this is in my blood. These days, nothing is more enticing to me than to see a guy I know huff from a bottle of poppers, remove a camel blue from its pack, light it with his lighter that makes a click and a whir, inhale slowly and deeply, hold it for a beat round his mouth and exhale a cloud of smoke at his rigid dick then lose a glob of drool that drips over his lip down his chin, landing and resting on top of the thick hair of his chest. When I see him entranced by his own body, my body comes alive and my mind races. I look at him in detail. All the aforementioned smokers shimmer in my unconscious. Blood rushes through both our bodies and these little fires so near our tongues turn bright orange, and we blow smoke into the room we share. These are the same fire and smoke of St. Peter. At that moment, I feel my friend's trust, his vulnerability, the destruction of walls between us. I watch him and I emulate him. I feel closer to him than I did moments before, and maybe I even feel closer to God. I flick the burnt tip of my cigarette into the ashtray, and I remember, I am just a man in a room, smoking naked with a friend who just coughed. I can't hear anything. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for allowing me to do that. (laughs) When will we see the zine? That's a great question. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have an answer. Yeah. Well, should we take questions from others that you can not answer? (laughs) I mean, yeah, I mean, if anyone has any questions for anyone, please, please, I don't know, do (laughs) something. Do something. (laughs) Something, I don't know. Great. And And if not, that's fine, too. Yeah, I think a great way to manage this is to put it, put the questions in chat and then we can just call them out and... Okay. Johnny does this for a living. Yeah, this is my day job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> questions? We'll give it a moment. I mean, if everyone just wants to go watch Drag Race, that's also nice. <laughs> I want to smoke. <laughs> 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 it's very weird to read in this environment because like if we're if I was at the bureau I would know when people thought something was funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it's it's and, hard to read and to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> not have it that any of that yeah feedback. I feel like that too. Yeah. yeah. Someday we'll be together again. <laughs> yeah. Um Rope is the most coded gay movie ever made. And actually, um, if you read the the play, they are actually presented as a gay couple. I'm responding to a comment. Yeah, yeah. Tongues of fire. Speaking in tongues. <laughs> what is tongues of fire? <laughs> um, I must feel like Cal could answer this better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like I can't answer this well, but. Um, it's a, it's a reference to the Christian 
a holiday of Pentecost, Pentecost. when the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles and there's literally flames above their heads yeah and, and speaks speaks in tongues of fire i don't know i really like it because i like the more sort of like mystical witchy things of uh catholicism <laughs> so i'm yeah. into it but um yeah i don't maybe you have more to say about that paul <laughs> no there's actually like a really good um explanation for like an animated explanation of pentecost on youtube and they literally it's like a cartoon and like little flames are above their heads so that's my understanding of it okay. <laughs> um lauren c would like to know if there are any other coded movies that you anyone would recommend anything come to mind um there's so many there's so many um uh what is the one suddenly last summer um, the other movies that I talk about are much more explicit, but, um, yeah. Um, Vito Russo's Celluloid Closet talks a lot about, um, coded films. Um, I think there's, there's a documentary and there's a book. Um, yeah. so, I mean, as well, as well as non-coded movies, but he sort of does like a, a big history of, of gay and queer films. So I feel like that's a good place to start because there, there is a lot. Um, especially um, like pre Hayes Code. Yeah. Um, and, and Paul, um, Christian would like to know: Can you share anything about the Private Idaho part of your <laughs> of your memoir? Give Give us like one line or a, a thought, something. Um, the the so when I made the initial draft of this, I wrote strictly from memory about how I remembered them. And in North by Northwest and in my own private Idaho, I had complete, like, misre completely misremembered parts of it. So I lumped them together because I talk about how I remembered things happening in the movie and how going back and rewatching it, they actually did happen. And weirdly with the, um, my own private Idaho one, the thing that I remembered was actually from James Franco's weird River Phoenix homage movie. And so when I rewatched my own private Idaho, I was like, w I know I didn't imagine this scene happened, but it was actually from a whole other movie. So. Wait, which, which James Franco, is that the leather bar it, thing? No, it's called My Own Private River. And it's like made from like Gus Van Sant's discarded footage. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't know that existed. When it's is on the YouTube. Come out? <laughs> you can watch it for free. It's not, it's not, it's actually kind of visually, I mean, I don't know if anyone here smokes weed, but if you're stoned and just kind of watch it, <laughs> it's kind of beautiful. There's a question for Luis. Yes. Uh, Luis, can you talk about your collage process? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Which are so beautiful, Louise. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, so I've been collaging all of my life. When I was a kid, my grandmother used to be a janitor at a posh convalescent home. So she would bring back all of these magazines from like Vogue, Bazaar, and I just started ripping them and started making things that, were, that reflected us and our experience. And I never stopped. And um, now I just, everywhere I go, I collect ephemera. So I'm always collecting magazines. I can't go anywhere without going to a thrift shop. I miss housing works. So that's a huge part of my everyday practice. And, uh, and it's kind of a, a stream of conscious type thing. You know, you just rip up things and put them together. So it's a great thing. Everyone has magazines right now at home. So you can start collaging right now is the best time to do that and if you need any help let me know I'm, I'm constantly putting up content on the collaging new york queer zine fair hosts a collage party and we need a host for next year Louis. no way yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's do it cool you can be the 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 collage mentor i can't wait to see what that would look like right like little glass cases for everybody <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the Hay Kel answered the Hayes Code question. Thank you. That's I didn't know about that either. So that's great. Yeah, they base wasn't that basically Hollywood was like 
ooh, we better police ourselves before the the crazy Christians come in and do it for us. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, I just I answered in the chat, but the Hayes Code, yeah, in 1930s Hollywood, it was standards that were enforced, and there were all these rules about yeah, you couldn't show like sex or like anything immoral, and so obviously homosexuality falls into like multiple categories according to them. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, there's there's some interesting stuff. I mean, there's interesting stuff during that time, but there's also interesting stuff before then that they could. I feel like they could play a little bit more with it because there weren't those rules. Um, yeah. Also, though, with the Hayes Code, I just think it's really important if you look at it, it's really mostly about um, like sexuality and uh, interracial mixing. Oh, yeah, for sure. So it's pretty much not really about gender and sexuality almost at all. There's literally one line they're like, also, immoral things are banned. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> widely interpretive but um that's yeah it's primary purpose if you read it you're like oh that's you know really about some other stuff um mm. so just to you know <laughs> thank you about this <laughs> oh, sorry <laughs> sweet okay any other questions for the team for the group thank you guys for being here tonight yeah yeah i really appreciate it and um you know, uh, I don't know, that's it. I just really appreciate you all being here and appreciate all your talents and sharing them. Yay. It's very meaningful. Yeah, this felt really, this felt really great. Everyone's work is so beautiful and it's, it's just nice to see you all. It's been a long time. Yes. It's nice to see everybody, yeah. 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 I can't wait to be back at the Bureau. Me too. I know. I can't wait too. to see your show. <laughs> I know, I can't wait to see your show too. <laughs> I can't believe that you've not, how did you, how are you mailing books without going to the Bureau? It's through, so our distributor. So online I can order a book from our distributor and have it shipped to someone's address. Oh, yeah. I thought you You're literally that, if, you need, if you need reading material, yeah. let the Bureau know and they will yeah. send you a book. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please email. support the Bureau. 